my intention is to share with you some thinking and some research I've, I've been doing around these questions about uh, resiliency. And so uh, it's sort of framed as a, sort of a, a series of prompts. And so I'm, I'd be especially interested, since many of you uh, in working on collaboration or public policy and thinking about adaptation, uh, to uh, sort of find some connections with your own research. And I, I'm, I invite you and I welcome you to share some uh, references or your own thoughts as I try to puzzle through some of these issues. Uh, so this is a, a work in progress, and uh, I'm, uh, uh, and I'm what I it's it's essentially a, a theoretical project. So this I'm interested in just us thinking and exploring some of these ideas. So the the topic is the the ABCs of self-reinforcing processes and network resiliency, and a sort of proposal on how to define and understand that and with these uh, notions about uh, adapting, bouncing back, and coping. And I'll, uh, by the end of the talk, uh, I'm uh, expecting this to be a, a more meaningful to you and maybe have more questions than answers. So again, it's a mostly a, a conceptual uh, project at this point. And so I'll spend some time talking about the, 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 the context and why it, I think it's interesting and important and uh, particularly the theoretical rationale. So what I'm really after is helping to construct and develop some ideas to, uh, to understand this. Uh, so the two operating concepts are resiliency and coordination in a network context. Uh, and then, so I'll spend most of the time on that, and then I'll spend uh, some time talking about the empirical basis for it. So it's not com you know, completely just sort of uh, theoretical, so it is based on some research I've done before with some case studies. Uh, we'll sort of breeze through that and leave time at the end for uh, an open discussion. But at any time, I invite you to ask questions to clarify uh, as we move through that. So I'm particularly interested in multi-sectoral networks. So uh, I'm interested in the relationships between government agencies, nonprofits, and firms. So the three main sectors that are part of what I consider the sphere on the arena for public policy. Uh, I've been doing this work for many years. It began with my doctoral studies at MIT. Uh, and right now, sort of the main questions are around network flexibility and adaptability. Uh, networks, as many of you know, has emerged in the last 10 or 15 years, and particularly as, a, for some, an alternative to markets and hierarchy. And so part of the, uh, the rationale for the interest in public management and public policy is that they are flexible. So the assumption is that that allows them to be much more uh, responsive uh, to public policy uh, issues and needs. And, and so this is part of the motivation then for this research. So this is the assumption. So if they are so flexible, uh, what are the implications from a coordination or management perspective? So that's the, core, that's the network coordination issue. Um, the second uh, piece of it has to do with resiliency. So as we all know, especially after 9-11, uh, uh, both in practice and in scholarship, there's been a lot of attention to try to understand how do we think about uh, adjusting to this environment that we're in uh, regarding uh, these external shocks to, uh, to to organizations and to uh, areas. So there's a variety of both natural ones, including earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, health pandemics and epidemics, uh, extreme weather, right? So we're now in this era that uh, we are uh, need to think about public policy and organizations and institutions that are able to sort of uh, adjust. And then man-made uh, uh, shocks as well, including terrorist attacks, civil national unrest, and financial crisis. So we are in an era of rapid accelerating change. So what do we do about it from a public policy perspective? Uh, most of this is situated in that bit of literature <clears throat> around public networks. And uh, so a great majority of that literature in the last 10, 15 years has been uh, documenting through case studies and creating typologies of networks and mm -hmm. 
collaborations, emphasizing structure and linearity, just describing things that are collaborations and networks. Uh, not so much attention and scholarship on how those structures change over time. So we know some things about uh, how public and nonprofit networks change. For example, uh, Isset and Provan, who established that public and nonprofit networks, formal and informal dyadic ties, persist over time. So, uh, and I'll sort of say more about sort of that rationale. We know some things about that. Um, part of the, the reason for this, I believe, is it's challenging enough to collect data on networks, and it's even exponentially more challenging to collect uh, data in terms of tracking them over time. So there is an empirical methodological challenge uh, that limits our understanding around networks. So that's one piece. But I think the larger piece and why we're here is the, what I believe is the lack of, of theoretical and, and conceptual uh, frames to help us understand that dynamic change. So we've got a, a variety of challenges uh, to try to overcome before we uh, try to address the, what uh, your Seedow sort of um, noted that there's a lack of dynamic theories and why it's one reason uh, it's been difficult to apply it to the practice of management. So these are puzzles I think that if we can get more traction and purchase on, there's more implications for how we can help public policy. So that's again some of the motivation. So here's a, a sort of foreshadowing of the conceptual framework. Uh, I'll show this slide three times now to give you a road map, to give you a sense of where we're going to go. And then uh, midway through about how, uh, how I believe I sort of explain this and then at the end. And at the end I think uh, how the pieces might fit together in your own minds. So the theoretical rationale is I draw on that there are these three forms of human coordination, markets, hierarchies, and clans. And uh, we, I think we, uh, the evidence of this organizationally is in terms of the sectors that we often think about that comprise the multi-sectors, which is there are um, for-profit uh, uh, firms, there's government that's traditionally thought about as bureaucracy, is, uh, and then uh, clans or, or sort of uh, social relations for nonprofit. So that's sort of organizationally one way of explaining why we have these three different sectors. So uh, research I've done in the past has sort of uh, tapped on that logic to describe uh, three kinds of strategies uh, that are implicit uh, when we think about coordination. So that uh, uh, a lot of the, like the work I focus on in workforce development has to do with understanding labor markets, for example, and how to help firms get the, the human capital and the labor that they need so they can be productive and regions can be efficient and prosperous. Um, and the role of government agencies in trying to facilitate that and uh, federal policy on down over the last recent years has been trying to improve labor market functioning and workforce development and create jobs. So there's a role of that which is more legislative, what we're familiar with in terms of that top-down control. And then the role of uh, nonprofits uh, in terms of being connected to various kind of constituencies and providing specialized support services. So. Um, and my argument I'll elaborate is that there's uh, uh, implications when they're all working together on choices, on strategies that, that we make in terms of trying to affect those changes. And then, uh, so there's a, so the, sort of the main piece then of looking at uh, resiliency is the fact that there's very little robust conceptual uh, definitions. So uh, it, it's uh, resiliency now is a buzzword. It's an idea in good currency, lots of uh, scholarship coming out, a lot of practice and legislation, and, but it, what is, there isn't is a strong theoretical basis. So that's part of what I'm trying to contribute to. So that's one piece. And then the other piece of it is path dependence. Path dependence is a similar, it's an idea in good currency. It basically permeates a lot of the scholarship, a lot of our sort of uh, as a kind of a jargon that we use, it turns out that it's also not very theoretically robust. We sort of have this sort of a shorthand of thinking about path dependence, right? Of organizations that end up doing things that aren't necessarily efficient. And so, uh, but it hasn't really been developed. And so, Jorg Sidow and his colleagues 
in 2009 tackled that puzzle and came up with a way of saying, here is a theoretical way of explaining path dependence. So what I did is sort of use that as the conceptual hook as a way of bringing in then an understanding of resilience into these three notions. So this will um, uh, be more meaningful at the end of the talk, but just to give you a heads up of where we're, where we're headed, this is the roadmap. So uh, again, uh, from a theoretical perspective, we've got these three mechanisms of organizational control, uh, markets, bureaucracies, hierarchies, and clans, and uh, which I sort of uh, reframe as entrepreneurial. So it's not necessarily, uh, in, in terms of a, from a coordination perspective, what it means is in the market, it, uh, it's sort of associated with this market-focused, opportunistic, uh, normative value and quid pro quo. So that's sort of the market logic, right? So those are one way of thinking about even a network, right? So people who define networks is all that, and it's only quid pro quo. And then uh, this notion that there are also rules and, um, and a normative value and legal authority in terms of what I call bureaucratic networks. So we think about uh, uh, federal, state, and local networks of agencies, governmental, there's still the construct, right, of this institutional set of, of values. And so networks of government aren't all flat and horizontal. There's still this vertical notion. So when we think about networks, there's different ways how those structures operate. And then the community is more of what we know are familiar with of NGOs and nonprofits, that they're collective or, uh, oriented. They're all about relations primarily and uh, sort of a high normative value and moral authority. Uh, and I won't detail this, there's a whole associated set of values with those three distinctions. So the research uh, I published in about half a dozen articles is basically defining and elaborating and making this argument that when we think about networks, all these organizations that we're already familiar with are present. They're part of the network. So we can't disassociate a network from legal authority, right, from hierarchy and bureaucracy. We can't disassociate it from the immediate sort of quid pro quo social relational logic, and we can't uh, disassociate it from market quid pro quo. So all these logics, right, are flowing through networks, through these sort of different collaboration. Again, my interest is from a public policy perspective of trying to understand so what, right? Because we, and so I push back on this claim that networks are basically just self-organizing. So there are, there's lots of that in the literature. And so what I say again, because of the institutional organizational components, that uh, there are different ways that from a, a managerial perspective, we can nudge and push, right, and, and design and move a network or a collaboration towards some goal. And from a public policy perspective, we often have these end goals. Right? It's not just sort of random self-organizing dynamics. And so uh, the argument that I make is that uh, uh, there are, based on the existing literature on networks, uh, ways of, of uh, strategically trying to nudge and move and, and motivate these networks towards this, this end outcome. One of them is this reactive facilitation, so that think about it as just facilitating networks. So you have, uh, so that you basically you can be, uh, so there's lots of uh, books and articles about how to design and how you manage networks. A lot of it is a facilitative logic. You just kind of go in, bring people together, figure out what they all want to do, and then you use facilitative kind of leadership to help them and move them towards you know, that, that, that goal. So that's, a, that's, for some network researchers, that's what a network is, right? And, uh, and that's it. Um, Others um, see it in a more contingent way, or active way. And so uh, for them, it's uh, what I call entrepreneurial. People have interests, right? Organizations have interests. And so you bring them together, and it's about kind of this reciprocal exchange and transactions. What are the different sort of uh, uh, imperatives for organizations to have? How do they discuss and, and, uh, and come to some agreements, make these deals? Um, and then through the quid pro quo to move the network. That's a whole nother frame, another lens for thinking about networks. And then uh, there's this uh, a more provocative uh, notion that networks aren't so different. 
than other ways that people and organizations work together. That there are explicit or implicit norms, right, and structures, and that you can, you, you can actually guide a network. So what might be familiar to many of you as a network administrative organization, right? So um, uh, sort of uh, a, a key idea that uh, Keith Provan in, in particular has sort of uh, really influenced and shaped uh, a, a generation of network scholars, that there is this hub, there's this, this nucleus of a, of a network that in a kind of a spoke way is able to coordinate a variety of services. And we see this in a variety of different policy arenas, whether it's uh, workforce development or mental health services or whatnot, where you've got one main organization that's tasked to manage the network. So they're much more hands-on, much more directive, right? In some cases, they have the resources, and they use the resources to be able to motivate behavior. So that's a much more sort of top-down network structure, but it's still an associational structure. So the idea here is that there's a lot of mechanisms that we're familiar with that we can use depending on the environment and what we want to do. So that was the sort of the logic of coordinating networks, right? And so, the, so my previous work was about trying to give these tools, both uh, conceptually and managerially, to <coughs> enable people to understand network dynamics and move them towards this, this end goal. Again, as I said, uh, Lots of uh, people now, you know, there's hundreds of definitions of resiliency. Not very much of it is, is uh, theoretically based, derived. So I hook on this idea because it enables us to begin to think about change over time. So again, um, uh, you'll see how his colleagues did was said, here's path dependence and a way of thinking about it in terms of these phases. So one is in an early stage, whether it's a single organization, which was his primary focus from an organizational research and organizational science perspective, that lots of things are possible. And then there's this, there's this middle phase where you have these self-reinforcing processes that are contingent, right? So we can't, we, the culture hasn't quite set. So there's a lot of ways that the, that the cu organizational culture can move in different directions. Um, and then, something happens, right, where it kind of locks in. And then an organization basically uh, has a pattern of behavior. And uh, so we could, if it, organizational culture is one way of thinking about that. Um, and then it sort of has this sort of momentum. And it just keeps going in one direction. And so that's one way of explaining path dependence. Um, and so what, what it means is that it's, sometimes it's very difficult for them to shift and change, right? So when we think about organizational development, you've got individuals, we've got formal rules, we've got social norms of the people in the organization, and then you know, they have one way of working. And so one of the big challenges for leaders and managers is then to figure out how to shift that. Path dependence is a, a more bounded form of inertia. So inertia, you can still change it. Right? It, it doesn't implicitly suggest that it's, it's, it's locked in, that it has, it has the weight of gravity. So you can have a new leader, you can change processes, you can do various things, and you can, you can get them out of a rut, right, is one way of thinking about inertia. But I think from a theoretical perspective, path dependence means that it's more locked in. You, you basically, you narrow your, your focal vision. Right, so, and so that's a slightly different sort of uh, issue than the organization being stuck. And so, which, uh, which is more, I think, relevant to a network perspective. Because in a network, you've got, you, you have uh, theoretically all these options. And so it's a counterintuitive that you'd have path dependence, right, pushing back on the logic of networks, that you would have actually within the network you're now hyper-focused on a set of pathways that limit the choices and, and other options. I think part of why path dependence is an idea in good currency is that a lot of people can relate it to experiences uh, that they have or research that they're doing. And path dependence is, so it basically sort of took off, but no one had really stopped to try to disentangle the pieces of it from an organizational perspective. And I, so I, I agree with you there.
And part of what a lot of my research is focused on is also with networks of, of not sort of uh, falling into what I believe is a trap of thinking that the organizational principles don't apply to networks. So part of my argument is that there are, there are networks that also aren't responsive to changes in the environment. Right? So that's a high contrast push from some arguments that they're completely different forms of organization. But let's revisit some of these questions. Um, so again, this is a, I've sort of cast a wide theoretical net of trying to understand organizations in networks and how networks themselves uh, behave. And the, because of the lack of, uh, of the challenges of, of doing network dynamics research and data, I kind of looked at other disciplines that there is a more established body of conceptual and empirical work on understanding network dynamics. So uh, evolutionary biology is one of them, right? So very well established body of research looking at ecosystems, natural selection, species variation, you know, and how uh, uh, we've got uh, adaptation as a way of understanding it through a complex array of uh, environmental variables uh, individual species, right, uh, come in and lock into a place. So, so it's kind of a, a reach to think about it. Uh, how do we know about how some networks behave? So that's sort of one piece. And that's adaptation. So we're all familiar with that. Uh, the other one, and that's, it's constant, right? So the, the, the sort of normative idea that it's constantly adapting to uh, environmental changes. Uh, and that's distinct from uh, what I call bouncing back. Uh, and a, an idea uh, drawn from the literature and ecology. Uh, and in particular, the example of a natural habitat restoration. So we think about a forest fire, right? These, these ecosystems that come in, the fire sort of wipes it all out, and it just comes right back, right? So the restorative principles of these network dynamics. So this is, again, well established from in, in that field of research of uh, one way of thinking about change and resiliency, right? They don't adapt, it's just part of their natural cycle and they just, they just come back as they were. So again, uh, you know, sort of uh, based on, on that line of, of research. And then this other one around coping. Uh, so this is uh, different from adapting and, and different from coming back to the, your previous point and then mostly uh, in social psychology, what we know from that research uh, is, for example, uh, for individuals that have traumatic stress, the importance of social networks in helping them cope. So there's a lot of research on that. Uh, things like um, managing pain, right? That it turns out that one of the frontline defenses of managing individual pain is social relations, working with other people. So there's a, there's a wide body of research that looks at that. So this is just a saying, we know these things. So let's see if there's any utility in these ideas. And let's break it down in terms of what's descriptive, what are the mechanisms, and see whether all those ideas can lead us towards some better understanding. So let's revisit about uh, 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 the advantages and disadvantages and how far and what, whether or not this works. But yeah, the, the mo you're, I think you're right in terms of my motivation. Like, let's really get at a fine-grained understanding of describing whether or not this applies to organizational networks. So here it is, that same framework, right? So now you kind of get where I sort of originally started in terms of thinking about multi-sectoral networks. Um, this, this project of uh, path dependence, mm -hmm. or you know, from another perspective, organizational inertia, we know that there's some kind of momentum, some sort of movement about organizations. Uh, my argument based on the research I did is that networks also, right? can be described this way. And, um, and because I argue that there are these three different kinds of uh, organization value sets and behaviors in networks, uh, we need different ways of describing them. So that's the puzzle that I'm trying to unravel. So then it's the question, is there a relationship between these network coordination uh, processes that I argue exist in networks and these self-reinforcing processes of network resiliency. And what are those self-reinforcing processes? Um, and more specifically, um, uh, you know, it, to sort of elaborate on the, on the chart that I just showed you, does adaptation, bouncing back, and coping, uh, 
re influence network resiliency to exogenous changes, like reduce resources in, in a public policy and economic environment. So this is where I sort of test out this hypo hypothesis and, and run it around the track. Like, does this, is this useful at all, this way of thinking? Again, this is based on this empirical research um, that I published in a number of journals uh, based on uh, six years of data that I've collected, uh, looking at workforce development networks. These are networks of government agencies, nonprofits, and for profits uh, that are trying to improve labor market functionings, help businesses get the, the labor that they need to be economically sufficient, and as well as helping people find the jobs that match their, their skills. So that's workforce development systems. So in Boston, they created a natural experiment, quasi-natural experiment, where they allowed three separate networks to function the same regional la uh, labor market um, and uh, to see whether or not there would be variation right, in how they uh, function in terms of these workforce development goals. So these are the goal-oriented networks. So one uh, turned out to be run, uh, run uh, uh, much like this network administrative organization. It was run by the state, so a classic bureaucracy hierarchy. And they basically had set up a network that, you know, not surprisingly, mirrored their own value set. And so, uh, and so they had a whole network around trying to do that. <laughs> there was a, another one that was run by uh, these uh, nonprofits. Many of them had 100-year-old nonprofits in Boston, very deep-rooted. Lots of over you know 100 years social and, 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 and projects that they work together, deeply social, socially relational, right? This notion of clans and that kind of community-based orientation. It's all like many of us who have studied nonprofits are familiar, deeply embedded um, sort of organizations. <clears throat> and so they have this community-oriented or logic. Um, and then finally, uh, a, uh, another network that uh, was more entrepreneurially oriented, more market oriented, run by the Economic Development Agency um, and an uh, entrepreneurial nonprofit. And they were uh, all about trying to use market based approaches to get organizations to collaborate and work together. So, three different kinds of networks uh, that emerged. Who is in that, who is, who's in the network? Okay. And uh, is it the same target populations in all three? And we're talking about different. Um, approaches to being a network or is it are they distinct groups so great question so basically this was related to the uh, development and implementation of the workforce uh, investment act <clears throat> so basically uh, a shift from the traditional uh, federal approach of doing job training and providing training for people to get jobs to focus on uh, universal access so before federal policy prioritized providing services for uh, employment and training and workforce development to nonprofit and the least skilled, least educated workers. So the Workforce Investment Act now, right, it basically is universal access. So anyone, whether you have, you don't have a high school degree or you're a CEO, can come in and get a service. That's one point. And the way they do that is by having lots of these relationships among organizations in terms of how they operate. So in, in Boston, you had three different centers as sort of hubs of these different networks that were allowed to go out to employers, for example, and provide services. And they could all go out to the same employer. Yeah, so same market, same region. Uh, so for example, this entrepreneurial one, they decided what we're going to do is we're, and what was different is that this legislation allowed these organizations, these networks, to charge fees for services on whatever the market could bear. So this was a big change, right, in, in federal policy. So what they did was they said, the market is the ultimate decider of efficiency and effectiveness. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to these firms and say, if you pay us money, and we have these tiered kind of packages, what we're going to do is we're going to provide training. We're going to give you access to our resume banks, right? We're going to connect you through these other uh, job training providers to give them training in terms of the, those first six months on the job, right? And if they turn out to be a good match, you pay us, right? So, they, so it's a really market mechanism. And, that, and then that revenue, they can then use to continue to build their network and offer more services. So they did that with employers, and they did that with job seekers. So a resident could walk into their center and their network, and they would have a tiered pricing on helping them with their resumes. 
for example. So you get free services on what resume preparation uh, if you never had a resume. If you're an IT professional, you pay $100, you get someone to give you a specialized custom support on how to prepare your resume. And they, so they did that for everything. So everything is priced out. And so they did that, and there's a number of nonprofits and that they did paid, right, in terms of services to be able to support job seekers or, or employers. So they all had access to the same job seekers and the same employers. So that was the entre entrepreneurial network, was based then on all these individuals and all these different firms, right, as well as the uh, nonprofits that they worked with. But they were so focused on the market that they went after employers, right? The community one, classic nonprofit, they were hyper focused on like low skill workers. They weren't really interested in going after people who could pay money for resume preparation or even these uh, employers that paid higher prices. So they developed relationships with particular employers who were willing, for example, to take on disabled workers. So they built up long-term relationships to say, you know, we're going to support these workers. We're, thank you sir, for doing this. Um, and they would have um, a variety of kind of relational-based ways of doing that. So they, their network was based a lot on really hard to serve. Uh, job seekers, right? So it's often what we think about for nonprofits. So they are all free to go after all the same, but their logic based on their organizations, whether they're entrepreneurial or a nonprofit, was uh, basically uh, sort of un as a quasi natural experiment, they're allowed to create their own networks. And then the job net network, the bureaucratic one, the state agency, they're a big state agency, right? Classic bureaucracy. And for them, it was a numbers game. So basically what they went after was like IT solutions. How do we create these platforms that we have maximum number of job seekers posting their resumes? And then we, we make that available to the maximum number of employers. Or we go after the maximum uh, sort of large size employers and really try to get as many people placed as possible. From a, from a public sector perspective, the more people we serve, the better, right? And so. So that's a long way of sort of uh, describing that. It's, they, it was very similar. They could choose, but they all chose, right? You can think about it as market segmentation. They went after different kinds of the markets, but these are different parts of the network because often the same nonprofits would have varying degrees of relationship <coughs> with all of these, be part of these. So you would even have a, um, an employer that would pay for services here, get high level services, and then get free services offered here. So they, it wasn't exclusive. So there's a lot of overlap, really dense overlapping ties. Looking at the economic workforce development of Los Angeles, LA has it set up that they have work source stations where it's primarily the job of the, um, the uh, work source station to figure out how to most effectively help the most amount of people. It essentially, it expands the target audience. You're saying the for profit was more for technical skills and. Um, things of that nature, whereas nonprofits were getting the lowest common denominator for people. The way that it's set up Los Angeles with these work source stations have it so that you get more of a broad spectrum of ha helping business get access to capital, whereas also increasing employment and a number of other factors while taking consideration. And the city um, essentially just checks up on them to see if they're meeting these, um, meeting me how well they're doing in terms of achieving these goals. And then aside from that, it's up to the organization themselves to, um, to maximize their ability to do so. So that would be a little different in terms of getting more target of a target audience, but then having split responsibility for, I mean, split, splitting of the, um, the agenda and um, having accountability um, that they're accountable to the city in terms of whether they're uh, achieving the agenda. Yeah, so the work source centers in Los Angeles, like work source centers across the country, right? The, the federal legislation allow anyone to come together and create these organizations and these networks. Most jurisdictions, most workforce developments or councils and networks chose one, one path, right, one way. So many of them are run by uh, either government agencies, for the most part, or nonprofits. There were a few that were actually run like, uh, in the South and Florida by private corporations. So that was part of the experimental nature of the Workforce Investment Act legislation, that a thousand flowers bloom, right? Very experimental. What was different here is what they allowed all of them to compete, 
because they didn't know. Massachusetts said, we don't know which was the right way, so let's find out. And so, yeah, so most places like LA, they basically have one dominant kind of pr public-private partnership arrangement. So what's interesting here, what I thought was interesting was, there's variability. So let's see whether we can use that information to understand, in particular, n networks. So, um, so basically, again, this happened. Uh, I, c I started collecting this data when I first started uh, at MIT. And uh, every year, I collected more and more data. And started uh, in the late 90s. Uh, and then, uh, and then, and then uh, in 2000, 2002. So basically, there are two main exogenous shocks, as I like to talk about it, since we're talking about resiliency. So what happened? <coughs> So the first one was the policy change, which was the full wholesale implementation of the Workforce Investment Act. It was also the tail end of welfare reform. So welfare reform started in 96. It took a few years for everything to sort of set it, set, settle out. But by 2000, you know, in, in Massachusetts, the welfare reform had changed the landscape for, for a lot of workforce development, in addition to the Workforce Investment Act. And then, you remember the good old days of prosperity? Late 90s, you know, internet boom. It was easy to get jobs. Employers were flush with cash. They were hiring anybody that could walk and breathe, right? It was a whole different era. And then the recession came <coughs> of the early 2000s. So the, so the two sort of changes are massive policy change and then economic change. So then the question is, did it make any difference to these three different networks? Did they respond and behave in any different way? All right. So uh, how were they resiliency? What was the, the key sort of uh, common denominator of both of those things, the policy and economic, was the diminished resources. So wealth reform, after an initial flush of money to help people get jobs and help organizations, the money is sort of bottomed out. So there was very little government resources for workforce development. And the employers, you know, the jobs dried up. So now you have a period of abundance, munitions, to actually very, very, a lot of scarcity. So how, then what do we, how do we then predict and understand how these different networks function, right, from these very different periods of time? So that's the shock. That's the, that's the resiliency. That there were these different networks with different logics. They had followed these paths in moving towards uh, trying to achieve these end goals. So what are the mechanisms? What are the very fine pieces that help us understand this? So where I landed on is something that's common in organizational research and also in network research is that there's something about formal connections and informal connections, right? And again, back to Asset and Provan, what they found was the dyadic ties between public and nonprofit agencies, they persisted at a basic level. There's something about these formal ties um, that basically would I uh, use that as a way of talking about things that are documented or written, so contracts, right? So or, or memorandums, memorandums of understanding. So whether it's from it's a government perspective, right, there's always documentation. So during the flush times, even the governmental sort of base uh, bureaucratically organized network had lots of forms and agreements and whatnot. The entrepreneurial network, right, when they were flush with, with cash and deals, they had all these um, um, fee-based agreements, both with employers and with, um, uh, with job seekers. So this was the data that I looked at. So what was formal was written down. And uh, so this permeated all three of the different networks. But also, because we're talking about networks, there's a lot that happens that's not documented or written down. There are handshake agreements. There are social relations. Right? There's the norms and different kinds of arrangements that people have made uh, based on uh, in-kind service referrals, word of mouth, uh, professional expertise exchange where people would move amongst in, in the network between nonprofits, for example. Um, and then I, I, uh, I attended a lot of meetings and events and collected uh, a lot of data that was collected as part of this natural experiment that the state of Massachusetts was doing, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts was doing. 
and then interpersonal exchanges, and then uh, manual record keeping in terms of uh, documenting these kind of referrals. So basically that there is formal mechanisms and informal mechanisms. So are, are these um, ex, ex ante processes or ex post? I, mean, I, I guess I'm thinking about the resilience. I want to, I would want to have networks already have these things in place so that when the shock hit, they could just play themselves out. Or is it the case that as the shock hit, they started developing MOUs and changing these things? Uh, and that's what created the resilience. Because then it's a different thing you want to look at. Great question. So this was all the basically the same and similar kinds of data collected from the very beginning. So part of the, the quasi-natural experimental design that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts did was they created a, like a, a learning environment, and they used <coughs> continuous quality improvement. Uh, so those of you that are familiar with that, heavy documentation, lots of flow charts. So all of these things were, I started collecting from the very beginning, from day one. So the, and every year they would have binders of data that I had access to. And every year I'd go and talk to people and interview them for six years. So I had a lot of data. Um, so to your question, that didn't change. So it was only the amount and the, and the type of data in terms of uh, the number of contracts or the number of MOUs. But let me say a little bit more and, uh, and, and see if you still have that question. Uh, for the job net, which was the bureaucratic network in terms of their coordination strategy, you know, just as we expect lots of procedural memos from the very beginning, how to do things, how a job seeker should upload their resume, how employers can ask for information. Uh, everything was standardized, right? Just as you expect from a large public uh, agency. Um, and, um, and so that was a, a, a large part of how they operated within the network. If you want to be part of our network, you need to fill out this form if you're an employer or a job seeker. So heavy formal documentation, right? A lot of agreements. Um, and uh, on the informal side, they would provide technical assistance. But it was really heavily reliant on these formal mechanisms. Or, or they would call employers, these employer cold calls. So they didn't, they didn't establish relationships the way a nonprofit or a community-oriented network did. Because once you hire a few disabled people, the next year you'd sort of say, how about hiring some more? And over the years, they'd built up these sort of social relational. Um, and but the job net, the, the state one, was arm's distance. We're the government. We're not going to like cozy up or we're not going to make deals with businesses. So they'll just do cold calls and ask them if they have jobs and here are their jobs. So more of a classic old employment <coughs> training approach. So again, are these sort of the pre shop period or it just, or are you describing how they respond to the shop? So this happened throughout the whole six years. So it's just a normal way of Yeah, this is how they operated. Okay. So this is, um, so the idea is that they, they started developing these patterns of interaction based on their logic of how they coordinated. Right, so I'm certainly laying the groundwork to think about path dependence. So basically, they had lots of different kinds of arrangements. They were very similar before that early 2000s shift, that pivot. And I'll say a little bit more about it. that is when the lock-in happened. So basically, the, the argument is that when you have this shock, that that is when the sort of whether it, perhaps it's inertia or this path dependence or momentum, everything contracts into the core way of organizing the network. Um, and then similarly for the, the entrepreneurial one, a lot of fee-based relational uh, connections uh, with right contracts, you pay for services if you're an employer or a job seeker, business contracts. Um, they also did a lot of handshake agreements, right, because they're entrepreneurs and they're making deals with these businesses and say, you know, uh, you can pay for this stuff, but we're also going to have weekly free breakfast for employers to tell you about what we're doing and the services. And, um, and if you happen to hear of a job, come and talk to us. So much more of that entrepreneurial, you know, mix of, of deals with money, but also uh, sort of a you know, good old sort of a, a, a approach. And then lots of customer feedback. So they're interested in how they can always improve their services. So this continuous quality improvement notion. Always trying to track how to make more money, provide a higher quality service. 
And then the community network um, having lots of mostly social service M MOUs. So they weren't really after the, the money from the employers, they were after you know, uh, collections of nonprofits who would agree, for example, to provide services to disabled job seekers. So you have a variety of different organizations and they would get together, they might go after some foundation or government grant to provide specialized services to subpopulations, right? whether it's disabled, women, immigrants, whatnot. Um, and, um, and a lot of it based on this informal notion of personal ties uh, in job seeker counseling. So, so the ways or the pattern, the mechanisms of the self-reinforcing processes, this is the hypothesis and the intuition I have, is that the, when you have more formal mechanisms within the network, right, more of the sort of documentation, um, that is what helps establish this pattern. Um, and during the formal and informal mix, uh, you've got a, a bit more dynamic, more sensitive to the environment, whereas the more uh, sort of community-based orientation uh, to coordination was informal. Because again, these organizations have been in the community for 100 years. They know one another. They've been on campaigns. So they're very friendly. They're very uh, familial. So these are what, is what I think are the mechanisms for these patterns. So again, during flush times, during the, before the recession and the, before the big massive implementation of the Workforce Investment Act and Welfare Reform, they're all kind of doing fine. Right? They're, everyone's sort of uh, operating at a relative high capacity. And so what I found is that uh, during the austere times, during the early 2000s, those patterns help lock them in to their behavior. So the reaction of the entrepreneurial network was, okay, we, we, you know, we can't charge employers to, to find job seekers and present it, them to them. How can we make money, right? What's the opportunity here? So what they developed was a line of business to help transition employers as they downsized. So that was their adaptive w mechanism. It's like, well, all these companies now who are riding high, had all these uh, workers, now need to fire people and let them go. And so what they did was say, we know a lot about how the labor market works. We know how to help people move on in their careers. So they started you know, selling services along these lines. So it's a, this example of the formal and informal mix. What they did was, instead of going to employers and just sort of throwing their hands up and saying, you know, our business model doesn't work anymore, they adapted and said, there are other ways, there's opportunities in this crisis, in this recession. And so that's how they shifted. And then they also sold now uh, packages and services to job seekers who are looking to find another job because they're going to be downsized. So that mix of informal, uh, formal, paying attention to the market, right? And so what happened was they changed some of their previous customers, went away, some of the same customers, now they changed their relationship. So it's a very different adaptive uh, way of doing that. Uh, in contrast to the bureaucratic, hierarchical, state-run ne uh, network, which was now we had so many job seekers um, and they needed unemployment. So now they kind of shifted to try to provide services to the unemployed by connecting them to unemployment insurance and other kind of support services. So, so a lot of uh, what they did was they basically abandoned employers because they couldn't really help them anymore and shifted towards workers, right? And now it was not just low skilled, but, but uh, high skilled workers. So now they reoriented, and they use these formal processes to do that. Um, and so in that case, they bounced back, right, in terms of what they had done traditionally, which was provide government benefits and supports. So they were, that was how they had originally started. They were based on the state agency that provided unemployment insurance benefits. So they were basically still able to provide services to high numbers of people. So if you looked at the performance metric, of how many customers are served, right? They did very well, right, in the recession because now they were serving uh, people who are unemployed. So from a government performance metric, we're doing our job.
we're bouncing back, we're doing what we always do, is provide services to people who need them. So the whole network was structured that way. And then the, uh, the community-based network, um, what they did was, as the resources shrank, right, so there's now fewer governmental public resources coming down through uh, welfare reform and the Workforce Investment Act, and you've got now employers who aren't coming to them because they have no jobs. So the social network, what it did was it contracted. So it contracted to their core uh, basic sort of uh, focus on uh, hard to place workers. So one of the nonprofits was uh, Goodwill Industries. Right? So Goodwill Industries being an example of you know, a very interesting uh, Brazilian organization started in the late 1900s. It survived uh, you know, um, two world wars, depression, many, many recessions. Uh, through its business model, and so the this whole network now retreated to to Goodwill, and so where they used to have a bigger office where they had services for job seekers and employers, the social network contracted because they did what they were always had done for a hundred years, is provide services to really hard to serve people, based on their you know uh, operating model, which is using the Goodwill sort of retail as a revenue form. So what they did was they coped, right? So getting back to the original idea about what happens when you have stress, right? Post-traumatic stress or these other kinds of, from a so social psychology perspective, you just go into the people you trust, to your family, to your friends, whoever's going to put you up, right? The, the last resort. Um, and that's essentially how this network then contracted. So a lot of their, their relationships with other nonprofits and businesses, those ties, those weak ties, Right, dissolved and became distant, diffuse. So they became a, 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 a core network. They still functioned, right? But they were now just hyper focused. So that's sort of the coping idea. They were, because they've done this before, right? Depressions and recessions, they'll just, they just know what they need to do at a very basic level to keep their network going and wait until, right, the economy or, or policy changes again. So three different kinds of arrangements. And so the, the question was, they, they didn't know which would be the most efficient arrangement. So, you, so the idea is that you could have chosen any one of these three arrangements. But from a public policy perspective, right, it's why it's so difficult to do randomized experimental design in public policy. We don't know. And so what they did was they took advantage of this, the freedom and the innovation allowed in the federal legislation to do this. So, but I hear your argument. Yeah, you can argue from another level that they should have known which way to go, but they didn't know in the beginning. I don't want to get to your conclusion. You may, you may tell us which was the most efficient, mm -hmm. but, but you already described they had different clientele. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how to compare apples and oranges here, which is serving those who can pay has its own efficiency maybe you could look at versus those who can't pay at all, and you provide services to them because they can't pay. And that may be an efficient way of doing that, but that's not the same efficiency as using the market test. I don't know what, you know, I, but anyway, I don't know where you came out on this or what the federal government said. It, it, they all look efficient, depending on their, or, or maybe or another or I'm just saying we can't compare across. It's, it's apples and oranges and bananas here you got here. <laughs> well, um, in fact, what, what often happened was you had the same job seekers and the same employers using services from all three networks, right? So. So they weren't, they weren't totally different. The same, so you'd have the same, if you're looking for a job, you'd go to these three different kinds of places through word of mouth, right? And there was no restriction about that. And the same thing from employer. So but if you couldn't pay, you wouldn't go to the, the entrepreneurial. But they all, they all had, they all, they all charged for services. So it wasn't like either or. So what I'm arguing is here are three different ways of defining resiliency. That one of them, is adaptive, right? So, so the, think about the implications depending on the public policy arena. In some cases, what we want is a learning organization, right? That the landscape, the environment has changed, and we want the, the network to be able to respond, right, and keep going because change is, is constant, right? What you need is a mix. 
if you have a mix of, of uh, formal and informal mechanisms, there are more likely, is the argument, is the hypothesis, to adapt, right? Adapt meaning that some are going to mutate, some are going to die, right? Some services died. Some, some services, because of the variability, emerged and they were brand new because you have the creativity and the diversity. So, so there's a one particular kind of adaptive resiliency, right? The other one is bouncing back. So, uh, so in terms of, uh, there are some systems that we think about providing clean water, electricity, right, from an infrastructure or public utility perspective. You don't want it to adapt. You just need it to reset as quickly as possible. How do you do that? Earthquake, right, uh, terrorist attack, how do you get things back to normal? And so one of the ways you do that is you have these uh, formal mechanisms, and which is why we have backup systems when we think about redundancy. One, one system fails, you get another one, and you get it back online. You have a backup generator. But it's these, these sort of formal mechanisms is what you do that. So for, in some conditions, this is one possibility for doing that. And finally, if it's immediate short-term survival, right, immediately after some crisis or shock, one of the ways that you survive that's been tested by the community network is you use trust, right? You use trust, establish relationships, social relationships, and you can get through. And so this raises other kinds of questions about short-term, medium, and long-term yeah, strategies. So if I could just, these are all organizational responses. And so how does that relate to, to the sense of a network, right? I actually think networks can be resilient and networks can do all these things. But, but, we're, but we're only seeing one, one actor who's responding to move the rest of the network. And it's not the network itself that's acting. I mean, in, in some level, you know, this is each of these three service providers saying, uh oh, I'm in trouble. I have to figure out what I'm going to do so I can survive. And so they do stuff. And it, it was less clear to me that anyone else in this network was contributing to that, that decision-making process to make it work more effectively, more efficiently, anything like that? I think for me it's a degree of emphasis. So part of their, their annual process <clears throat> for chartering from, from Massachusetts was that they would again do the strategic plans, they would survey customers, employer customers, and, and individual job seekers, and they would have focus groups. They would be required to, to submit statements every year about what, what were your mistakes last year? What were your successes and what, were, what did you learn? So yes, they were all had varying degrees of being learning organizations. They all had varying degrees of being backup or redundant or serving their core. They all had varying degrees of trust and immediately trying to respond. Yes. So, but it's a question of degree, right? And so for me, from a, the reason it's a network issue is in an organization, you know, you, you basically, even though there is some variation within organization, each of the networks checked in, right? They had focus groups with all their, their job seekers and employers. But the point is they, how they approached that, the questions that they asked, what they decided, what their core competencies, their competitive advantage, advantage they're all based on their, their own network arrangements. Right? It wasn't a single organization. And so they made collective decisions, basically network decision making around how should we proceed. And the point is that there is variability. Right? They didn't all just say, we're going to just do one thing or the other. And so this gets that back at, in terms of the mechanisms of the self-reinforcing processes, when you have a variety of formal and informal kinds of uh, ties, um, you have choices, right? So from a, from a public policy and a managerial perspective and a network coordination, strategy is choice. And so what I'm trying to tease out are what are the range of choices that a network can begin to think about depending on how they want to get there. Now, they weren't sure. Like, they each thought that they were going to be able to get to the same place. Performance metrics, like that's, that's two other articles I've written. I didn't really elaborate here. So it corresponds to some of that in terms of how many people they serve. So the bureaucratic government one had high numbers of people that they served, right? Um, and so from that performance metric, again, they did great. The entrepreneurial one, very small, but very high need, hard to place workers. And so it's a qualitative decision. It's the number of people that you serve or the people who need lots of heavy services. And, uh, and then, again, from a public policy perspective, as from a learning, is like, how do you design public policy? 
right, that accommodates the fact, particularly in a multi-sectoral network environment, that you've got all these different actors and constituent organizations which, with different distinct organizational logics. So this is the, the puzzle that I'm working on, right? It's different than saying, it's a different question to say in a nonprofit network, what's resiliency? And then we can begin to look at the variability of types of nonprofits. In a similar way, um, for, you know, if we were in a business school and talked about what is economic resiliency for firms, you know, different set of questions. And so my sort of, uh, the puzzle I'm trying to deal with is a lot of our public policy sort of issues are multi-sectoral. And so it's a much, it's a little bit more nuanced and complicated in terms of trying to figure out the, whether it's nested networks, sub-networks, uh, strong ties, weak ties, dyadic, triadic ties, right from a structural perspective, there's all these different mechanisms. And so, so your questions are, I really appreciate them, it's sort of spot on in terms of, it's, it's uh, how do we really figure out whether there are some principles, some patterns that are a, a sort of a basis for a conceptual or theoretical way of thinking about that, that it's not all just anecdotal or, or idiosyncratic. So, and I knew that, um, so we've been doing this. So yeah, this, and it's a risk, you know, it's a, a risk reaching for adaptation, for looking for uh, ecology or looking for social psychology, but because we don't have a lot of empirical data from a network perspective, looking at network change, it's a risk we take, right, as scholars and researchers about what, what's some traction? And so I think what I'm hearing from, so from you all is that, you know, eh, you know, there are some are riskier ideas than others, but the, the basic notion is that where I've landed is consistent with a lot of what we know from organizational research and network research, that there's something about that the formal and informal connections, right? There's something about that that are related to the mechanisms of how networks function, and in particular, for dynamics. How networks change over time. And again, this is, a, this is different than some of the scholarship that, that basically overemphasizes either informal ties or formal ties. And so once we get into that gray area, that continuum of what are those boundaries and what's the nuances in, in understanding that, particularly from a, a policy or a managerial perspective. So uh, I think we're almost out of time. Any final comments or questions? Mm -hmm. So it, it, is that in your thinking at all, the, the, species, the characteristics of the species? So then we would have to look at the human species and, and, species and ask ourselves, what, what are the behavioral uh, differentiation uh, characteristics among human beings? Uh, we don't all behave in the same way. I don't buy the notion that we're all interested in limited self-interest in our, I think the Tocquevilles Self-interest right than understood makes more sense to me. So, you know, do you, do you ever look at that kind of micro, fine-grained part of networks? How human beings behave? And um, I focus mostly on organizational networks, and so the special variation among organizations, which is why I've landed on these three different kinds of organizations, so public, nonprofit, and for-profit, as three main types of you know, species when we think about organizations. And um, it's, it's one of the implications is I'm interested, at, if I'm understanding your question correctly, about looking back at individual mm -hmm. sort of behavior. And that's a different research agenda. Um, but uh, but I, I'm thinking about it more now, so thank you. Okay, but I do think, you know, just to, I, if there are some general typologies across these three categories, mm -hmm. like I would guess that sort of you're more entrepreneurial, has generally fewer assets and resources on hand to relative to, to uh, you know the nonprofit versus the for profit company that I'm familiar with everyone says the for profit company has all this cash in the bank and they can just buy things that nonprofits can't yeah. and it provides different kinds of frustrations and challenges. If you could sort of distinguish between those and the governmental is you know a mess. <coughs> right. So but have a few dimensions there which could I mean, it could speak to sort of which levers even have a hope of reacting to stress um, relative to, you know, others. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.